All right. <laughs> Away from parallax scrolling, back to uh, frameworks. All right. A um, few more minutes of attention, and then you are uh, freed forever. No, not quite. But um, <laughs> we're getting there. Let's suggest it's an approximation of that the semester ends, yes. Um, so there's various frameworks for actually doing you know, graphics programming, right? So I mentioned already that OpenGL is fairly uh, independent. It's basically um, developed or continuously developed by a consortium consisting of graphics card manufacturers, I think game manufacturers in there. It's like everyone. It's a bit like the uh, Handset manuf Manufacturers Alliance in Google, right? So um, we're just similar, composed of software developers, uh, uh, platform um, uh, microchip developers and uh, handheld manufacturers quite similar here and the idea is there that OpenGL in itself is just a framework that says well how do developers interact um, with the environment uh, with with, uh, with the framework so pr provides the interface the API basically um, to develop um, 3d uh, or 2d applications um, uh, for, that have some sort of some sort of graphics uh, element, and the responsibility on the part of the manufacturers then to implement this in their hardware or link it against their hardware, right? In their drivers, basically, it needs to be mapped to their hardware functionality. So the idea is then that any game that's developed in OpenGL for a given uh, well for any platform really should run in principle on any other platform that. Uh, um, that has a graphics adapter that op supports OpenGL, right? So inherent portability, that's the idea. Uh, in reality is usually quite a bit more brutal, but, um, so, um, but that's in principle the idea. And then there's also, of course, DirectX, uh, which is uh, not as portable as really, has the same principles, um, requires the drivers uh, of the graphics card manufacturers um, to support the uh, API calls and implement them. But they are um, traditionally only running on Windows anyway, so um, there's not much um, relevance. From a mobile device point of view, that whole perspective is dead. Uh, Windows Phone is dead since two years or something, right? So that the Windows 10 version for phones, which kind of didn't work out, so they scrapped it. So uh, don't spend, yeah, don't waste time on it effectively. Um, so. And why do we have different versions? Well, there's different uh, reasons. One of them, let's see. Oh, yeah. um, so we have different versions of OpenGL, and um, the, the idea is that they capture different uh, functionality. So over time, OpenGL has shifted and changed. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but also um, different feature sets. So that can accommodate, for example, more uh, 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 lean devices that have not necessarily the um, required <laughs> feature set or power to actually uh, use this, uh, provide this functionality. For example, compute shaders, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and so, it, 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 while it's a natural progression to suggest that a device should support OpenGL 3, it may not be natural from a uh, hand, handheld uh, uh, manufacturer's perspective, be de be simply depending on the uh, juice the device has, right? So you still find devices that actually don't support uh, the latest OpenGL S version, even though in, open, uh, in Android 7 onwards you're required to support OpenGL ES uh, 3.0. So, um, so that's, the, that's the framework. Now I want to get to the idea. Um, yeah, so I think to, to motivate this a bit more, I think it's worthwhile to um, talk a brief about the OpenGL pipeline. And instead of me talking about it, because I probably did like three or four times, one of you will talk about it. Um, so can anyone explain me what the OpenGL pipeline does in a, in a human accessible way? And um, yeah, basically how it functions. Does anyone? Do I need to throw bonus marks at someone here? Or no. Come on, anyone. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> the question. Can you describe the OpenGL pipeline? It's a good, good uh, exercise anyway. Uh, yeah, so you start off with just the vertices and then you try to make more vertices out of those vertices that you have and then you make a selection which is just uh, making even more uh, vertices but not specifying exactly the location from what I can understand. Uh, even though you can, uh, though it's subdivision and that installation is like what you do between all the vertices uh, or like for e each individual pixel and not for vertices and then the final stage I don't know. 
that's just plotting it to the link it to the graphics, send it to the graphics driver basically to project it to the screen, so to the frame buffer. And that's what's coming up uh, on your stream. So that was the technical perspective on the thing. I do it a bit more high level. So we have the individual points or vertices, right? That that are we, the model, right? The huge Stanford bunny or I don't know, a fawn, let's say. And uh, we inject it into our uh, pipeline. So the idea in OpenGL is you specify uh, the input at the beginning, you kind of configure the pipeline. At the end, hopefully you get an image and some sort of animated model if, if, you're, uh, if you did it right. So you need to have a model that consists of the individual uh, vertices, like the bunny, and um, associated uh, um, specification, for example, uh, should it be, what kind of surface should it be, uh, the potentially textures and so on, but I ignore, ignore those a bit for now. And then you um, process them in the vertex shader, which is basically a program that runs in your graphics card and uh, modifies those vertices based on um, those points in space uh, based well, on, on your, on your um, um, yeah, based on the needs of your program, right? So, and there's various other forms of those shaders, for example, like a tessellation shader, where you, for example, can subdivide existing surfaces that are generated across, let's do that visually, perhaps. Yeah, that was not as good, but, but anyway, uh, so the idea is there, if you, for example, have three vertices and they are, used um, to, to draw a triangle in OpenGL, you can kind of subdivide this some, uh, somewhat as well, right? So for example, by having, um, introducing additional triangles, you can also make this for stage, for example. The idea is there, instead of, while you only need to specify three points in the beginning, the GPU um, will uh, automatically infer those additional points that you suddenly need. And that allows you to create, for example, much more smooth surfaces, right? With a triangle, you're limited as to which you can't bend it, right? So, but by introducing additional vertices, you're suddenly able to represent much more smooth surfaces. This operation is reasonably expensive if you do it on the CPU, right? So the conventional processing unit, but reasonably cheap if you do it in the graphics processing unit. That's why you offload it to that machine. The idea is there, you inject little programs called shaders into that pipeline that works based on the input you gave, right? So, and refines it uh, in various ways. So it's a geometry shader that allows you to multiply vertices as well. So you can do further refinements and so on. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, uh, um, um, to do that. So this, Afterwards, we generate some primitives. So that's where we say, I showed you before, where we say, well, we actually want to have triangles or we want to have uh, quadratic shapes or whatever else, right? You basically attach a surface. So suddenly you start uh, uh, making uh, yeah, surfaces, faces out of uh, the individual vertices beyond their simple connectivity, right? So, and following this one, um, the system basically gives up on thinking in terms of shapes. Right? The system then says, okay, now we need to get closer to uh, the representation on hardware, and it happens to be that we work on uh, raster-based layouts, right? So we have pixel-based devices, so we kind of need to now map each model coordinate, you know, we move into space and have it positioned somehow. Okay, how does this coordinate, or where does this coordinate appear on the screen, right? This translation process, basically reducing a three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space that is supported by our devices, is uh, uh, um, um, started at the rasterization stage and then you as a, at a later stage when you get those individual fragments those individual pixels you can still apply uh, functionality to it right so you can for example increase the brightness or reduce the brightness or uh, apply some um, yeah any sort of other modification uh, that you can think about what would be good other applications of fragment shaders what can you do there What, what, what stuff do you guys do in the fragment shader for your ex uh, assignments, for example? Just to... Uh, cheap subsurface gathering. Okay, yeah. Something that sounds... Uh, something more... simple. Coloring? Yes, you're right. You modify the colors in a wider sense, right? So, but, okay. So that's, that's basically what you could do there. Quite um, straightforward. So you have two points of intervention. One is where it's about the physical shapes, right? The 3D shapes, and then a later point when it gets closer to the display and you focus on individual pixels and actually refine how it will look on the screen in the end. Then um, it's kind of uh, multiple 
Images can be mixed or interpolated uh, depending on particular specification. Nothing you can influence and then it's displayed on the screen. So that's basically how the entire pipeline works. So how you get from individual vertices to models that include lighting, shadowing, everything that basically manipulates color and brightness in the widest sense, as we, as we mentioned before, and then subsequently plots it to a two-dimensional screen. So, okay, OpenGL pipeline, roughly understood. This is reasonably generic. While I'm talking here about OpenGL, it's very similar to DirectX or uh, Vulkan as well, right? So, reasonably. That's, a, the, of course, the old uh, OpenGL2 pipeline. And um, while it's in... Um, The, the OpenGL ES versions are kind of um, a little bit behind the uh, fully fledged uh, OpenGL specification, of course, uh, since we're cut down versions uh, for mobile devices. Um, similar to, does their is their functionality. So generally, uh, ES stands for embedded systems. So if you see that, it means, okay, this version is really meant to run on mobile devices, not on fledged, fully fledged uh, desktop machines or the like. And the first version of OpenGL ES was actually quite uh, simple. You didn't have those this ability to actually modify. Hang on, there you go. To 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 uh, modify the um, those shaders here, right? So you weren't weren't really able to inject um, your own code and functionality, meaning you couldn't exploit the GPU functionality as much. The idea was actually quite simple. You just inject the vertices, and it all magically with some configuration it comes out here. But you're not actually running any algorithms within the, uh, uh, um, at least not custom algorithms within the GPU it's yourself. All is predefined, including lighting, for example, is also predefined. You have a lighting concept, uh, but we get to that in a, a bit more. So um, so with um, OpenGL ES2, the idea was introduced of having the programmable pipeline. That was pre pretty much what we just talked about, where you can actually inject little programs, shaders into the uh, uh, pipeline itself that are executed at runtime. Um, and with OpenGL ES, then there were uh, compute shaders. We didn't talk about them in graphics because, yeah, because they are reserved for graphics too. We'll see um, if we get that we, course. We, talk, we talked about it in uh, GPU program. Yeah, well, that's that's the obvious course because it's literally about this. It's about doing not necessarily um, um, computational tasks that have visual output. Meaning you can do general purpose computation on your graphics card. You guys know that from. You know, there was, uh, for example, uh, cryptocurrency mining and things like this and uh, was um, um, uh, focused on those ideas. So it's no longer uh, reliant on any uh, graphics output attached uh, to that. And this is done by compute shaders. Of course, the output can feed into visual representations, but it doesn't have to. So that's introduced with OpenGL uh, 3 um, onwards. So, um, and it also includes uh, tessellation. That was that concept here, where we have this automatic subdivision of uh, 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 surfaces, for example. And uh, with OpenGL uh, 3.2 for the graphics people, it's roughly equivalent to OpenGL 4, right? The fully fledged uh, version. That's the key idea here. Looking at support, uh, OpenGL 1 was supported by Android 1.6, so ages ago, basically, pretty much the second officially available version of Android after 1.5. Um, OpenGL 2 on Android 2 and um, <coughs> OpenGL ES is available since Android 4.3. So pretty much all the devices will actually support uh, at least OpenGL ES 3 if you're interested. And with um, and, uh, Android 7, it's required to support the full, full, full lot of it, including OpenGL ES 3.2 and the Vulkan um, 1.2 version, if anyone is interested. Okay, so those were roughly the, the, the different versions, uh, but just to give a bit more of a motivation there. Um, um, the original 1.1 version was actually quite straightforward and simple, and I just want to compare those, uh, 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 the, the, the principal approach to give you an intuition as to how simple it actually is. And the idea is there, you have to provide the system with some texture. But texture is basically Im it's an image that's plotted on a surface, right? So we can, for example, use a cylinder, plot a image of a, a Coke can on it. It looks like a Coke can in a three-dimensional space. Right? And the idea was there, okay, we need to set up the textures, um, do blending and uh, test specification, which I'm not going into right now. And then you uh, basically switch on and off a set of parameters, such as do you want to do environmental mapping, which is basically cheap reflection, right? So you have some object that sits in a three-dimensional space, and you basically say, well, do you want to map the environment 
that's sitting in front of it onto the device itself. So it looks like you have some reflection on the device, but it's basically a, a, a simple way of switching it on and off. Um, then you have lighting, so you have up to eight lights which you can position in space, but they are also fixed in their functionality. You set up a camera, so in the three-dimensional space you need to define, okay, where's my camera situated right now? And um, what possible transformations, meaning what, for example, uh, uh, rotations of an object in three-dimensional space you want to apply, right? So, and then you just inject the data and draw the whole thing, and that's it. So, but there's no real intervention other than providing those parameters at the initial uh, uh, stage. And um, with OpenGL uh, ES2, um, the, it basically removed a lot of this built-in stuff. And the idea is there that the user developer uh, um, himself is now responsible for providing this functionality, right? So, for example, the guys that are doing graphics right now, you don't have, there's no actual lighting or light concept in, 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 in OpenGL. You need to invent it yourself, right? You define a light, including its position, uh, its, its functionality, and so on. So, um, also, the built-in transformations have largely been removed, but instead you need to do it somewhat yourself in those shaders, right? In those, uh, in the vertex and the fragment shaders that we briefly uh, motivated just before, which has an own language. So now you're suddenly dealing not only with uh, Java or C++ on the CPU side, but you're dealing also with the um, OpenGL shader language um, on those shaders. Basically like a C-like language uh, that is quite straightforward, uh, but obviously can be very complex depending on your operations you're doing on individual um, vertices. So, so here's a bit uh, uh, different. So the idea here is, okay, we can still set the, sh the textures we obviously want to use and um, the, 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 some interpolation mechanisms and so on. But then afterwards, we basically just say, well, here's the shader program, which I developed as well. Please consume that and associate it with either the vertex manipulation or the fragment manipulation, meaning the pixel manipulation at the end. And um, yeah, then it's about the interaction between your uh, actual code on the CPU and those shader programs, they can communicate to some extent to um, actually def you know, define and draw the model of your choice. Meaning you do all the mathematical uh, functionality yourself. You no longer rely on OpenGL uh, doing that automatically for you, but it gives you great flexibility. Um, yeah? So it moves you away from a graphics uh, interpretation that allows you to say, well, that's OpenGL, I know it, to one that is actually so customizable that, is, that it will be um, distinguishable from others. Um, so yeah, you need to do a lot of stuff by hand. And then OpenGL ES3, just to motivate the idea, is the compute shader. So you can work uh, with large numbers of somewhat independent objects um, and can calculate them at the same time. It doesn't necessarily need to have physical out uh, visual output, uh, as I mentioned before, you could do, uh, for example, deep learning on a GPU, so you don't get visual output at all, but nevertheless, you can do the complex cap um, computation incredibly fast. And um, why is that? Yeah. Uh, uh, the graphics card is heavily parallelized. Cool, so yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the fundamental idea, right? So by having some sort of heavy uh, parallelization, you you you, you um, can um, quickly process those tasks, uh, uh, process independent tasks a lot faster. Requirement again that your software needs also be parallelizable, right? So you need to be independent, have independent tasks, and there's an intervention by my mature student, please. Okay. Um, so um, and the the idea is basically there that you. Um, need to have an application in which tasks are independent from each other as much as possible and then it's easy to spread across uh, um, the, the GPU um, course and actually have the computing done in parallel so you're a lot, lot, lot faster and uh, so a motivation uh, with respect to that in a second, please. Yeah, so, so one main reason is that, that it has uh, a lot of independent processing units which can do work in parallel. That's fundamentally why they're so fast. But there is another reason also. What is the second reason? Shared memory. Huh? Shared memory. Yeah, and very fast access to memory, like DDR5 or faster, yes. That's uh, that's another one. What else? So what limits the speed of the com computations? The, the speed of the CPU? 
right? The number of the CPUs. What else? What else is the limiting factor? Clock rate. Huh? Clock rate. Clock rate, yeah. What else? The memory more than anything because you need to load the data. Yeah, so the bus to the memory, right? Yeah. So what are the current processors? How many bits we have for addressing stuff? 64, right? The modern architectures are 64 bit. What's the GPU <coughs> using? What's the length of the words in the GPU? 256, oh. right? So most of the stuff that takes uh, multiple memory accesses for a normal CPU is just a single read for a GPU. So all the buses are like 256 bits long, uh, which has a huge improvement for doing floating point arithmetic and for doing reads and writes and so on, right? So being parallel is one, and also being kind of a, having a very wide bus is another one. So the normal CPUs have an extension called SSE. Have you used it? Those are like a multimedia extensions for Intel processors. They've been added, you know, 10 years ago or so. They have multiple iterations on those, right? Exactly. And then uh, they, it started with MMX, mm, right? Yeah, so that's right. That's that right. was the first yes. stuff that they've added to the Intel CPUs. It was those MMX instructions. Yeah. And what they, those basically were that you could read multiple uh, memory locations at, in a single read. Right? So those extensions basically allow you to read and write 256 bits in a single clock cycle. Right? Uh, so those are th th this is fundamentally another aspect which makes GPU much faster than the normal CPUs. So just a side note. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's for heavily, you know, um, um, as Marish pointed out, but just to emphasize the uh, perhaps the organizational aspect, this is copied from a Kronos, uh, which is the specification group um, for 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 um, um, OpenGL and and and, and um, the other standards that we talked, or many of the other standards we talked about. Um, so it's basically just an highlight on how the uh, internal organization basically works, right? So we have some sort of uh, memory that is directly accessed on the uh, GPU itself and then um, individual tasks are dispatched to working groups. And the working groups are then uh, consist of multiple individual threads that are basically in, in executed independently and have their own uh, uh, shared memory. So the whole architecture builds on the idea of parallelizing things, but, but in a, um, by themselves the tasks are, uh, are fast, but it's not like uh, incredibly, power, uh, incredibly fast, it's rather the power of the masses that comes to play here. By simply removing the, the load from a single threaded or somewhat multi-core CPU that iterates uh, over items but uh, spends a lot of time with coordination and synchronization, uh, here's the idea to uh, re remove those restrictions as mass much as possible and just be have a best effort um, strategy um, in terms of uh, performing uh, operations then writing them back into memory and then ultimately just writing them back into graphics memory so they can be consumed for whatever reason, right? So either by the actual graphic for the actual graphics output or uh, from the CPU again, if you're just doing some complex um, calculations. That's the fundamental um, idea there. Um, so yeah, I kind of highlight those aspects. So the, the idea is they're having computators that purely operate on memory, so they don't have any explicit assumed um, uh, variables for in and output, uh, in, in like other like the other shaders, uh, but actually you just need to directly interact with memory and just uh, um, dispatch uh, works uh, work across a specified number of um, working groups with yeah. So you specify the number of working groups uh, and the individual threads within them when you dispatch the uh, workload. That's the, the key idea there. Just to motivate um, some of the points uh, a bit better, perhaps. First of all, uh, this one has been a while back. Did anyone see that before? I bet yes. You know that? No. That's Mythbusters. I, I introduced you Leonardo, and he's going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. So that would be CPU-based drawing, right? So the idea that we have a 
reasonably well performing machine, but nevertheless working sequentially, right? So performance task. Leonardo. When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. GPU <laughs> painting demonstration. Yep. And 10. Nine, eight, eight uh, seven, six, painful. five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually quite nice, the uh, visualization. Science class is now over! Thank you! <laughs> of course, that's a... Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> It's an abstraction from yeah, reality to some extent, but I think it shows the essence, right? So uh, having the, uh, you know, even if it's well performing, if you have really fast sequential execution, uh, it would still not be able to uh, uh, make up for the high parallelism, even if it's simplified, right? To some extent, here is all everything is exaggerated, but that's the key. That's the key idea uh, of Andres. Well, another more realistic example, of course, uh, which is probably more to um, relevant for us here. I wanted to show you is just to. Um, uh, in this case, it's using Unity physics um, uh, framework, but now on a CPU. So just to have a massive number of um, objects basically interacting in a scene, so falling down, and then you see the secondary notion, and then there's some interaction with the <coughs> green object in the center, um, and then you see you will see the performance. So the frame rate uh, is like uh, sits at three, right? So three frames per seconds right now. So it's not like super interactive. Worse, it actually uh, depends on the state of the simulation, right? So when it's actually falling, it's now it's considerably faster actually. Uh, now because the interaction is only restricted to a very few uh, uh, number of balls here. Um, but of course, um, those are the boundaries. So if you look at the same thing from a GPU perspective, it looks much more fluid, right? So. So we're sitting at a frame rate of about 37 frames per second, and you know there's no no constraint to interaction at all. The frames, the lowest I saw was 25 something or so on, but now 36, 37. So it's uh, um, it kind of I think neatly highlights the difference in terms of uh, performance between uh, GPUs and CPUs, especially if you can isolate the operations. Um, I kind of want to see that in real life, actually. It's kind of really... Um, so anyway, so just to motivate uh, uh, some of the ideas of um, what, what you can do. <coughs> Without showing that, you can figure out, uh, have a look at this yourself. It's, it's um, used for, in the graphics context, it's um, quite heavily used for, uh, of course, image processing, such as a blur. If you want to apply a blur across an image, it's reason reasonably expensive to do it sequentially, but if you do everything in parallel, you can immediately, within a split second, uh, um, perform that. Another aspect is wave simulation. So we have a certain independence of the individual um, uh, components, so have a very fluent perception. There are some nice videos out there as well. Uh, and of course, AI simulation, right? So as long as the individuals have limited interaction, then you can um, uh, simulate inter uh, behavior as well, for example. But it's, uh, yeah, I think slightly less suitable because of the need to interact. <coughs> okay. Um, right, so uh, just looking at bringing us back to Android to some extent. Um, so there's quite a bit of um, uh, guides on how to do that, how to deal with this in uh, Android. And they're actually quite good. They are uh, start from scratch. And um, <coughs> the challenge you are dealing with is a um, few aspects. Number one, you want to think about, um, not necessarily about um, uh, necessarily only developing for the latest version of OpenGL, but think about your catchment, right? So unlike a PC where you can expect people to have at least uh, OpenGL 4 point something, on a mobile phone, it's much harder to make that assumption. So you need to decide: okay, do I uh, develop my, um, you know, 3D my game for a crowd that only has an uh, OpenGL 2.0, uh, um, for example, right? So that's a trade-off you need to um, deal with, and you need to declare the version you're using explicitly in the manifest, so uh, in, in Android. But you will also need to um, 
test uh, against the um, successful in initialization in Android. So even though it may, uh, the, the platform may specify that it will support OpenGL uh, 2. Point or 3.2, it may not actually provide the functionality that underlies it. Right? So we know that from physical processing, uh, from, 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 um, sorry, from desktop computers as well, that sometimes uh, drivers of graphic cards over promise, but actually don't really provide the necessary functionality. Uh, when it comes to window handling, there is a uh, pre-provided pro, pre pro, pro, uh, provided uh, window handler, um, that's the GL surface view, <coughs> and which you can interact with, and then you can implement like uh, some um, event listeners as well that allow you to well interact with the 3D environment. For example, um, what happens after a frame is drawn, the, when the surface changed, or when you know, uh, of, of course, also the classical listeners such as the touch on touch listener if a user presses something on the screen, so you can actually modify your um, 3D um, output accordingly. Um, because of performance reasons, um, the, preferable use, the preferred use of OpenGL uh, ES on Android is to actually use the uh, native uh, development environment, right? So the NDK, which is basically C++. Um, so you would write all the C++ code in, um, um, uh, well, so all the graphics code in C++, and then define an activity just basically links and binds to it um, at, uh, at, at, at runtime using the uh, Java, so called Java native interface. I'll just, sh I wanted to show you something. Had, hadn't my system just frozen? Okay, um, all right. we'll figure it out either way. OpenGL, yes. So that's the, that's a good guide anyway um, to just get started. Hope my systems come back again. So so the the key thing is the GL surface view that you'll be dealing with, and that has a certain event listeners that allows you allow you to interact with, and a lot of extensions. So there's the uh, in addition to the conventional OpenGL functionality, there's a so-called Android ex extension pack AEP, which is integrated in OpenGL uh, 3.2, which is specific to Android uh, extension specific to Android devices. Uh, that's worthwhile um, highlighting. But that's not what I want to talk about. Here you indicate how that you use OpenGL, for example, by indicating um, the version here, right? So version 2, version 3, version 3.1, for example. Um, challenges that are associated with this are the um, drawing. Um, because OpenGL, I didn't mention that, has a coordinate system that is, uh, has the boundaries uh, minus one, minus one, and one, one, right? So every drawing needs to happen is centered around uh, the coordinate zero, zero. And um, of course, on mobile devices, that may be stretched depending on their uh, uh, you know, dimensions and layout of the screen estate. So you would need to accommodate for that uh, programmatically somehow, right? So either by uh, making the, um, um, the, the, the vertex positions variable um, and depending on the device you're using and so on, um, yeah, or accepting this 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 problem or constraining the use to particular devices that you know about but uh, what i wanted to briefly sh show you is um the ndk uh example to show you how it's actually interlinked i found that somewhat ah there you go my thing is back finally so just to motivate how this distribution is actually um, done. Mm, okay, there you go. <coughs> So the idea, that's the usual Android application as you know it, right? So if we go into the um, main folder, then we see a differentiation between uh, what is CPP, that's the C++ code, and the Java code. Let's look at the Java code first. So we see a conventional, um, activity. Yeah, 
And the only thing it actually does that the rest is just uh, uh, m magic. So those methods are basically mapped to native uh, methods that are actually delegated to C++ for execution. The only thing you actually need to do is load the uh, library hello JNI, which is basically compiled C++. And then um, all this functionality, the one that is specified in this interface here, is uh, available uh, for your Java application. That's the key idea. And that's uh, precisely how it's done in the case of um, OpenGL. I'll just bring up an example. Yeah, here it's testing for devices. That's not what I wanted to show. I want to show a bit richer code. Um, hello, OpenGL, yes. Ah, GL2, there you go. That was the one. So a prince is always the same if you use the NDK. Uh, of course, this is not restricted to the use of graphics. For example, if you want to get oftentimes uh, better sensor readings, I believe Marius did an experiment on that a few years back, uh, then sometimes you are uh, faster using uh, C++ code, right? So yeah. because you're actually getting close to hardware and not constrained by the abstractions of uh, um, Android itself. But here, um, for the ones that, that have dealt with um, with OpenGL, they will see a lot of um, 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 code they're used to. For example, here, that's how you specify shaders. Uh, if, if you look at it, so in this case, it's a string specification. It looks like a yeah, mini program. Basically, here, the idea is that you have some sort of attribute, a position, then you have a main uh, function, and it's something is it's doing something. Uh, to, no, it's not doing anything to that position. It's just returning GL position which is the input for the next stage of the uh, OpenGL processing pipeline. Similarly, the fragment sta uh, shader, the shader that sits further down this pipeline, um, doesn't do much either, actually. Right. So um, re it returns a fixed uh, color um, 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 output. So. And then you have the, all the C stuff, there's load, C++ stuff that's loading uh, shaders and so on. Nothing you'd worry about. The key thing is uh, simply that all the functionality here is written in C++ and from Java you're just uh, um, linking to it. The only thing you need to do is to provide those JNI exports um, that um, um, indicate which of the functionality is actually mapped into Java and then can be used um, from there. So there is an opportunity for, for interaction between um, Java and the native um, environment. I'll just show you in this application here how it's actually um, loaded, which is similarly simple. So let's look at the activity. So literally, the only thing it, it does here is uh, um, create a new instance of GL2 JNI view, and the uh, GL2 JNI view links to those um, the underlying library. So it's basically like a wrapper that exposes the most important uh, functionality. For example, like the uh, default constructor, the initialization. Um, yeah. So yeah, all the functionality you need. There's no point going through that in, in detail, but the intu intuition I want to get across that half of the work is done in uh, Java. Oh, so now 90% of the work in this case would be done in C++ and a bit of it in, in, in Java. So uh, here we see that's the functionality that would be exposed um, to, um, to Java. Okay, um, right. So um, I'll put out the uh, slide set and here are some of the links uh, related to the topics. They actually have a good, quite good overview of how to and, and quickly get you going and uh, de develop the, what's called the Hello Triangle, which is kind of the Hello World for 3D, uh, for, for graphics programming uh, in, in Android going. So if you're interested, check out those links. They're fairly good um, out of the box and actually fairly updated as well. But of course, um, modeling a three-dimensional space is, is expensive, right? You can't waste all your time developing models and the environment and, and, and the interaction, animation, colors, and so on. Um, so um, you rely on um, uh, frameworks for doing that, and you guys, especially the ones that do games, are probably quite acquainted with Unity, um, or not, if not yet, then at least next year. And um, of course, there's an Android version of that as well. So you basically develop in Unity, and it should run on, uh, or yeah, runs on mobile devices in Android as well. They recently changed their model, I believe, from a um, from a paid version to a subscription-based approach, right? So, um, 
So it's actually not too cheap to run it for, uh, for, for a commercial operation, but of course for uh, your own purpose. I think there's a free Android version, Marish, do you know? For what? Unity, is there a free Android? Yeah, yeah there is. It had, hadn't always been the case, right? In the beginning it was paid, right? Yeah, so they introduced it like two years ago or so, okay. so now they have uh, a free version uh, up to some revenue that you're making. Right. And then you can, you have to pay for that paid version if you're making more money. Cool. Uh, and it's similar with uh, Unreal Engine. Right, okay. Yeah, so Unreal started it first and then Unity followed the suit because they yeah. were losing market share. Right. Yeah. But well, we see a general trend towards those the subscription-based models anyway, independent of uh, that the payments, right? So, so now, now both of them are sort of using the subscription-based models, whereas uh, Unreal is free uh, and takes five percent of your cap of your rev uh, revenue oh, yeah. uh, at certain point. Right. So they not you're not paying subscription, but they take Good. a cut of your right. revenue, whereas Unity has a subscription model. Uh, and it's not cheap. They they take like uh, fifteen hundred euro per year or something like this. So okay. it's like hundred twenty five euros per month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's uh, yeah. Those are the current ones, I think. Yeah. So yeah, bear in mind, bear that in mind if you do this, uh, of course. Um, but there are also um, other versions that I checked. So they had been out for ages, but they're still around uh, and still used apparently. Mm. This one is, I think, hasn't really been developed in three or four years now. Uh, but it's uh, Shiva 3D. Um, yeah, you can try it out uh, and, and play around with it, and explore them, and uh, use them for mobile devices. Um, um, yeah, so that's that's one worthwhile pointing out. There's an older engine that uh, was still um, still around, but it's probably not worthwhile considering. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, does, please. Does Blender game uh, support Android or? That's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think know. so. So I don't think so. Uh, because they need the runtime to run the, the Blender games and it's quite bulky. Uh, so my intuition is that it doesn't, but we haven't tried. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps worthwhile experiment for porting it. Okay. If you need a last minute bachelor project. Um, so <laughs> a bit more than that, I suspect. Um, of course. So, in addition to open the OpenGL, um, there's also has been a standard coming out, and surprise, surprise, it's called WebGL. What do we expect? And it's out there for a while already. The idea is basically there. Okay, how can we do 3D in, uh, in, in 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 web browsers and so on, right? So, and for relatively simple interactions uh, on displays, it's actually a viable alternative um, to to use that as well because it's uh, also supported for mobile devices uh, uh, apart from the desktop uh, system. So, depending on how uh, platform independent you want to be and how much effort you want to expend it may perhaps even be viable to think about a WebGL version to, to do those things right so and you can also have interaction happening with this so you can do simple uh, game perf um, uh, activities but generally the abstraction between um, WebGL and your underlying hardware is greater than the one uh, in uh, OpenGL ES so uh, if you are looking for performance of course your uh, go-to tool would be using OpenGL in Android for example yes but this basically all, um, yeah, we want to talk about in terms of graphics on uh, mobile devices, of course, a bit high level and uh, uh, largely motivational. Um, but the idea was to bridge the gap between, okay, what, you know, what's the functionality that we actually have available if the need arises and you want to do something in real 3D as opposed to just animations um, um, on which you might largely rely on right now, right? Or doing manual uh, 2D calculations on your, on your, um, on your real estate um, for your for your applications. So, any questions or thoughts? And yes, Vulkan is available as well for the gamers uh, amongst you. Good or not good? Cool. So, I assume. If I were to suggest any questions regarding the exam, suddenly there were, were some, right? Oh, neither. There you go. Um, I was wondering if all the questions will be uh, like theoretic or if some of them will be uh, more about programming. Like, uh, yeah, how, how you do certain things or they're just theory. 
the exam will likely be, I mean, we, we have some practical questions uh, later certainly, but the exam will likely be more on the conceptual theory side. So that showing your understanding of, you know, uh, uh, principles of uh, mobile development, a bit more of the high level, so knowledge base. The, the intuition is that the portfolio is largely responsible for covering the skills based aspects, yeah. right? So where you actually show that you know what you're doing and, and you talk about it in the presentation as well. So we'll try to introduce as much as uh, uh, possible skill elements into the exam as well. It's not always easy because we actually don't want you to do uh, dry programming there. So uh, I would definitely prefer uh, theory questions. Oh, you, okay, you favor theory. Okay, okay. So, but, but also let's say, think about experience. For example, uh, most likely when developing, you, ex you had some experience uh, that you drew out of the frameworks that you're using, right? So things you actually don't explicitly learn, but you, we want to test you for your experience you have gained in that course as well, yeah. right? So those would be aspects that you don't study for, you'll just be able to answer. But the ex uh, exam uh, will be heavy on, uh, heavy on theory, I suspect. Any comments? Yeah, Mr. so it will be there are more theoretical questions than practical, but there will be some practical questions as well. But uh, practical as in not, uh, practical as in solvable practical, yeah. something you most likely did. We just want to ensure that the same person that did the assignment actually set the exam, right? Because we need to link those two marks, so. Yeah. <laughs> did you decide on the points, like minus points? Ah. No, we haven't decided <laughs> yet. Uh, no? Still work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one final question. Uh, of course. That's, that's a, I think it's a reasonable request. Um, we'll probably be able to narrow it down a bit, right? So it's uneasy. To, to, to some extent. To some extent. So it's, it's usually requires a bit of coercion than you will. But uh, yeah, um, but the, the, we probably can certainly identify some stuff that's just irrelevant because we, um, you know, just. Yeah. Um, I mean, a point of reference is all the lecture slides and lecture material. So if it's not there, it's very unlikely to be in the exam. <laughs> Usually we avoid that. Uh, we could narrow it down a little bit further, but we, yeah, we'll see how we do But in, in either case, we will have a session on the exam uh, after the, uh, probably in the next Friday session uh, during the presentations, to which we would uh, you know, like to invite you all, please. But yeah, I don't need to invite you guys. I need to invite you guys. Anyway, um, uh, to, to, to the session to actually attend it. And then by that we will have a much more refined uh, perspective on the exam. And then uh, we can probably narrow it down a bit. Uh, yeah, it would be nice to have like, just a summary. Yeah. yeah. I know that you guys are all under certain pressures. So some people assign some, a lot of people bachelor's um, uh, thesis right now. So we appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Cool. Any other comments? Okay, no much comments from my side. Uh, remember to prepare the uh, presentations for next week, right? So like a five-ish, I guess, minute uh, spot presentation. You know, no formal requirements as such, but just get the message across what you did, you know, uh, uh, and perhaps have everyone in your group participate in the presentation so it's not just one person talking, ideally. Uh, of course, that's not always feasi or super feasible, but you know, by feature, you could distribute your, 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 your um, uh, contribution and uh, show something, right? So on something that we can show on the screen, ideally. Um, personally, I would perhaps recommend you to make a backup video in case things don't work out. Uh, because they're often then not, don't, especially if it's under pressure and a lot of people and changing devices and, and things. So if, if, if you want to play safe, you can also make a video. But of course, the live presentation is clearly preferred, right? So it's more like a fallback mechanism. Uh, but also a good documentation of your project. Right? So think about your um, long-term portfolio. If you, for example, hand in your CV, that's uh, something you put in there, linked to your unlisted YouTube video of what you did in you know, graphics programming in, in this course. Um, but that's, that's just a minor, minor point there. Um, anything else? Submission is clarified so far, right? You, you sent an email about submission last night. Okay. Did, you did, right? I did. <laughs> Somebody had your account. Really? I'm pretty sure. Wasn't there a Blackboard message by him? No? <laughs> okay. Um, Simon was one, Rust prototyping? Yeah. So, but how's submission uh, uh, working then? 
Yeah, good question. <laughs> I was an impression there was an email. Sorry, too many emails. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, good question. So the deadline is on fifth. We still have a bit of time to figure that out. Yeah, we have to do that. Yeah. So please appreciate our professionalism. Yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> we get there, you know. <laughs> But yeah. it, it, it's, it's not like you're not working against deadlines either, right? So, I mean. <laughs> there will be uh, some web forms. Yeah, okay. So we come back on that uh, in, um, uh, on, on uh, yeah, probably.